How are you doing? Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Grateful to uh, connect with you. Well, thanks. Gladly. Um, first off, congratulations on the book. <laughs> well, it. Uh, yeah, I think it looks pretty good. The, you know, it's it's it's. I I hope people will enjoy it and learn something from it. Have you gotten a hard copy of it yet? We've gotten two of them, and, okay. um, but with the the shipping problems, it, it was printed in China at a wonderful printer. Um, our publisher is a fantastic publisher, and and uh, they do a lot of art books and 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 film books, um, you know, kind of retrospective of various films, and the their reproduction is just a plus. It's uh, really looks good. But yeah, the, the, I, the travel is so 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 yeah. delayed. You know, it was delayed like two months. That's the case for everybody, so it's totally understandable. Um, yeah, I only got the PDF version of it, and oh, yeah. it looks amazing. Like the book is great, and the writing is great, the story is interesting, all that. But the graphic design layout, um, all of the memorabilia that you seem to have still intact imagery, stuff like that. And then the little chronological timeline that's over on the side at the beginning of each chapter that kind of tracks the evolution of your career. It's really, really well done. Oh, nice. I'm glad you liked that. Yeah, I loved it. Um, I'm going to give you a proper introduction and post okay. production so that you and I can just roll into a casual conversation, if that's all right. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, in the preface of the book, you talk about getting that first Kodak movie camera when you were 13 years old, um, which I would imagine was no small thing back then. I mean, cameras weren't easy to come by. It's a young, you were a young age for your parents to gift such an extravagant gift to. It was, that was true. The, the, uh, I'd already shot still photographs and built a dark room in, in our garage. Um, and so I, I had an enlarger and I, you know, did stills and enlarged them, had fun with that. Um, but then I wanted to take it to the storytelling level and do something more artful, you know, with, with editing and animation and things like that. And so, um, and my parents weren't wealthy, you know, we were um, kind of middle to low middle class and in terms of income and, uh, and so they used green stamps to get me that camera one Christmas um, or a birthday or something like that. And the, uh, um, so I started making eight millimeter movies and editing them. I got a little editing machine that I still, still own. But I mean, you're looking at little teeny images, barely see the images, they're so small. And then, Later on, you know, I saved enough money up to um, to buy a 16 millimeter camera outfit and started shooting what I felt was a professional movie uh, about surfing, about surfing in California, particularly on glassy waves, and you know, kind of a a rare, strange movie that took me four years to make um, called A Cool Wave of Color and that um, film kind of showed me what I could do and, and gave me confidence. And, and, uh, uh, and since it actually revealed a profit, um, you know, I was able to then be stimulated to keep going and, and make an, another film and then another one after that and so forth. And so I just, you know, I paid for the first one, A Cool, cool Wave of Color, by mowing lawns and and uh, babysitting jobs and and digging trenches for my dad at his construction projects, and uh, um, so I didn't have any risk with that first film. You know, it was all paid off and didn't get a loan or anything, and and so I was able to basically um, try new things and you know make a film for myself, not for other people so much. But thankfully, others liked it, and and it became 
a, a kind of a minor success for its time. And then, um, and, and my second film became even more successful. And then I teamed up with Jim Freeman and, and the third film we made um, became a, a gigantic success. Um, it was called Free and Easy. So that was my early start in, in basically finding that I could make movies and, and um, entertain people with my photography and my editing and my ideas and um, then just kept doing it. Um, at, the, at the age of 13, when you got that first camera, what films had you seen that um, were reference points for you or that really set you on this trajectory? Probably the most major one was Lawrence of Arabia because it was shown in 70 millimeter five perf in stereo sound. And, you know, I love the story and I love the adventure and the big scale and, and the music and this, and basically the storytelling, which was pretty epic. And um, I always thought, okay, geez, it would be great to do something like that, to move people emotionally, um, show them parts of the world they have never seen, give them ideas to think about. And, um, and that's what I've always tried to do with my films is, is open, open the world to others. Um, was there anybody who had done that in surfing at that time? Well, th the same year that my first film came out, um, 1964, was the year that The Endless Summer came out. And that was indeed the first film that had travel as part of it. Um, and that kind of adventurous spirit of, of storytelling with two characters and um, a real plot. Um, all the other films, um, including my own, were um, kind of montages and, uh, you know, start and step, start and stop stories um, without much continuity, kind of a semi theme. Um, a Coin of Color was more of an artistic uh, musical montage and but all around the theme of California hot dogging, which was unique in the world at that time, um, and particularly hot dogging on glassy waves, where you know it was a, a very few places in the world have glassy waves like California. We've got the kelp, we've got a continental shelf that kind of dampens uh, the waves, and um, then we have those beautiful mornings when there's not any wind and you get these, you know, crystal smooth waters that are just so wonderful to glide over. And, uh, and, and so I thought, okay, this is kind of unique in the world. You don't see it in, in, in any surfing film. Let me just concentrate on this. And so I'd get up really early and, uh, and try to find surf. Well, you do a beautiful job of explaining, um, what California is still like to a large degree. Um, in your book, you said that it was, you were kind of born into the perfect place and the perfect time. Can you explain what era was that in California and what was it like back then? Well, in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, you know, after the war, you know, after my parents' generation had suffered through the depression and World War II and the, the the dangers and the risks of World War II, you know, Hitler trying to rule the world and then the Japanese trying to do the same, you, you end up with a time of optimism. And I think from the time that I was born in, in 1945, um, right as the war was ending, um, the optimism in America particularly, um, more than anywhere else, um, and, and in California, probably more than anywhere else in America, you had this feeling of anything is possible. Um, you know, there were all kinds of jobs that were beginning in California with the aerospace industry, and, um, you know, you 
basically plenty of opportunities with kids coming back from the war and the GI Bill and the, you know, it was it was a time of optimism and and hope and and true belief in the in the future of America and uh, and what was possible and what we could do with what talent we had. Um, and for a kid who I, I'm, I've always been a project person, you know, I love the conceiving and starting a project and the process of getting through it and then final, you know, finally finishing it and, and seeing what we end up with. Um, that, that's been my life. That's what I really love doing. I love that whole process. And I, I think that's what Californians were into then. And, and my mom and dad were the same. They, my dad built houses after being a school teacher for eight years. They then started building houses. He was a woodshop teacher in junior high school. And he said, well, maybe I can build houses. You know, I know how to work with wood. Um, and so he started building houses um, and it was tough to sell them. And, you know, back then, very few people in Orange County had jobs in Orange County. There weren't very many positions. And so um, the sales weren't like they were to, are today. You know, I mean, it's a different environment completely. Um, but he just loved doing the projects. And I saw that and I was the same as he was. And that's what I loved about making films. And the good thing, um, you know, I had confidence that uh, I could get into the University of California um, you know, with a B average at a minimum and <laughs> back then. And, and it was the low cost. And um, so I, I knew that my college was was clear and, you know, I was a good student, um, but I could spend 85% of my time on my films. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I knew I didn't have to get A's in every class. Um, you know, my girlfriend, Barbara, you know, she wanted to go to an Ivy League school. So she was getting A's and, and chiding me for getting A minuses and B's. But, you know, I was making this film. And so it was, I was having a lot more fun than she was because I was working on this, this uh, new kind of movie. And the, uh, uh, it, it was just one of those moments in time where, I think everyone had the optimism and hope of just a, a brilliant future. And um, I think it's really the case today, except people know more and they get <laughs> the media is such so, so oriented towards fear mongering, <clears throat> you know, basically that's what sells, sells time on, on channels. And so, um, but back then, you know, you didn't, you had the radio and, and then later three channels on TV, but that was it. Um, yeah. And so you didn't get that, the, the negativism and the, the pessimism that you get today, but um, it was a different time. And uh, I think all of my buddies felt the same. Um, we just really love doing things and trying new things well the um there's some great archival imagery in the book of california in that era wide open spaces fewer roads um yeah. and one of them is of killer dana on a good yeah. on a good swell probably eight feet right juxtaposed with kind of a modern photo of the dana point harbor the wave is now gone. There's now a road going around the bend. Um, but what I was surprised by with the Killer Dana shot is how many surfers there were in the water. It looked like a normal crowded day at Upper Trestles <laughs> or something. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the there with longboards, there weren't that many places. And, and Killer Dana was one of those places that was good on a big swell. You could, you know, there was a nice big channel to paddle out. Yeah. Um, there was the pier right there. If you wanted to jump off the pier, you know, you, you basically can maneuver the big logs out there and catch a wave and, 
um, even ride way out on the shoulder if you wanted to, um, is a different kind of surfing. I mean, this is pre-leashes in a different style, but yeah. um, it was a beautiful wave to surf. You know, you could get really nice bottom turns because you got had plenty of nice, nice size and speed on on takeoff, and um, it was a cool wave. It's it's yeah. sad that it's not here still. You know, they could have oh. figured out. I always thought that they could have figured out a way. Had there been maybe the Surfrider Foundation back then, um, which there wasn't at that time, there would have been a way to build that that same harbor. Um, but still uh, achieved the wave, you know, kept the wave. Um, yeah. They, they, they would have had to bring that out, outer breakwater back in another hundred yards, but they, they don't really need that, you know, extra space there. Um, they would have lost a little bit of space, but no slips. Mm -hmm. they, would have brought, they wouldn't have lost one slip. And so anyway, it's sad that, you know, I think they, they would have understood that today where they didn't back then. Totally. Um, who were the surfers at that time that were kind of important in that area? Um, well, they were the old timers who, you know, Keller Dana was, you know, Lauren Harrison and, um, you know, the, the Hoffman brothers and people like that who really weren't that good at surfing. But then there was Mickey Munoz and, and, uh, um, Phil Edwards and um, my friends Rich Chu and Bob Lee Mocker and um, Alima Kalama from Newport, Mike Marshall from Newport, Chris Marseille from Newport. Um, a lot of hot up and coming surfers in the early 60s. Um, and, you know, a lot of fun, you know, back then you had to fight the marines to get into trestle and san onofre was the surf club so if you weren't in the surf club you know you know you really can't couldn't get in easily um there were ways to sneak in and you know i write about one of those ways that i used way back in the early 60s um where i forged a uh san onofre surf club logo uh, like I was a member and put it on my car and and got in <laughs> and, and then hid my dad's car in the bushes at Trestle to get to Trestle on just this amazingly beautiful day you know and we were when we arrived of course we got chased by the marines but we then got to the beach and the marines went away and and uh, we had it all to ourselves just two people um, me with the camera on shore and then and Bob Lee Mucker out in the water. And then, uh, then he'd come in and I'd go out surfing and, you know, it was, it was just a different time, you know, totally. it, you know, it, and it's, it's a really good thing that, that trestle is open and that the state, I mean, that's the one excellent thing that Nixon did when he left office was um, say, this should be a state park. It should be open. Yeah. Um, and, and that's been the best thing in this region because you have trails and you've got all, you know, all the wonderful breaks, churches and San Onofre and so forth open to the public. And, yeah. and, and a lot of probably, uh, or a lot of protected spots south of that that aren't open to the public that uh, kind of are unknown. Um, whose boards were you writing back then? Well, my first foam board after buying a terrible balsa board from a friend who shaped it, um, this was 1958 or 59, um, was, was a Hobie, uh, the first foam board. And then, then after that, I, I started writing for Harbor and he, for some weird reason thought it would be a good idea for me to get free boards from him so I <laughs> wrote his boards and I loved them and especially you know when Mark Martinson started shaping and you know he would build boards that were real fluid for bottom turning and and just kind of wonderful cruise surfing and you could ride the nose and um 
you know, they, they were wonderful, like round tails. And the, uh, uh, and so I, and for a while I had a trestle special, which was kind of a get up and go board, a little less maneuverable. Um, I, so I didn't like it as much, but the, uh, um, you know, the good shapers, um, I think were people like Mark Martinson who knew really a lot about surfing and he thought about it every day and he was so calculating and inventive and, um, and so, uh, and, and, but so, and some of the other shapers were doing good work, um, but they were more like factory shapers. And, and so it was just getting the job done and they, they didn't really stop and think about it too much and try to be innovative. Um, they were just selling boards. The, back then in, in the mid sixties, you know, when surfing really took off, um, you know, they're selling so many boards because the East coast opened up and there's, there's just hundreds of boards going out every day. And yeah. it, it was a, a big machinery kind of thing. And, um, and some people, sim shapers burned out and went on to other things, but, but um, that was about the only way that surfers could make money. Um, you know, later on, thankfully, things got better for surfers and yeah. could act, could actually make a living. Well, what's funny is now there's no way to make a living off shaping surfboards. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. you have to do something else. Yeah, um, that's true. So um, the reason why we're having this conversation is it's the 50th anniversary of Five Summer Stories, which I think was your fifth film. Can you tell me what the concept was for the film? Yeah, it was it, it, it was about um, well, I wanted to to, to make a, a series of ideas into stories and and not and wrap the overall package around the concept of um, kind of the man's beginning on planet Earth and then and and trying to and man trying to find nirvana trying to find basically the the best experience for his existence and and uh and the way that man finds this heaven on earth which we call the tunnel of love um at the end of the film was through an association with nature, a, a connection to nature, a, the, the, the understanding of nature's importance to us all. And that was the overall theme of the film and you know, keeping the planet healthy and uh, so that we could enjoy it and so that we could, we could feel that we are part of it, that we are connected to it. Um, and so there was a structure, the, the creation of earth and, and that man leaving land to, to find a more simple existence in the water and then um, various stories through the film including hard-hitting stories about the unfairness of competition and, and exploitation of surfers for profit and then all the way through to uh, heaven's gift to man which is the tunnel of love and the uh, and you know, at the time, our main goal was to show surfing in a new way, in a new style with um, music that was stereophonic and a soundtrack that was at least half of the importance of, of the, the experience. And, um, and so it was a joy when I found Honk in Laguna, they were playing various restaurants um, and I love their music, really pure, simple rock um, with beautiful lyrics and great melodies and wonderful instrumentation. 
Um, and then at the same time, the Beach Boys were going through a transformation of recording style and, and ability and, and their sensibility towards their own music. They're moving radically out of their simplistic writing of uh, the early 60s, kind of their surf mu music and car music um, into a mo much more thoughtful and beautiful kind of music. And, and, and they called me when they found out that Jim and I were making our final surfing film and they said, we'll allow you to use anything you want to use from our entire library without cost. And we just want to be associated as you do with a, a really wonderful movie about surfing because we feel we, we owe it. And, and only two of the Beach Boys were actual surfers, but um, they did surf. Uh, Bruce Johnston and, and Dennis Wilson were both avid surfers. And they, um, thankfully for, for me and the film, they had just put out an album called Holland. And then, and, and before that, uh, an al album called Surf's Up, which ironically had nothing to do with surfing, <laughs> but, but was named the, the Rolling Stone album of the year. And it was a gorgeous, you know, it had a gorgeous album. It had feel, the feel flows and, and the song Surf's Up was beautiful. And they're, they're using recording techniques that um, only the, the Beatles rivaled. Um, no one else was anywhere close to what those two bands were doing at that time with recording quality. And I wanted to do this as sort of a, Five Summer Stories is a kind of a combination of rock concert and thoughtful filmmaking, done, beautifully done. And so it was, so it'd be very memorable, but, um, and very oriented towards surfing, not, not a general audience film, but a film for surfers. And uh, when, when the Beach Boys told me that all of a sudden uh, the ideas for the movie took shape and and uh, it it you know became this um, different kind of experience uh, uh, of a surfing film it, it it was more of a boy sit in the theater and laugh at times but most of the time you're moved emotionally by the music and the beauty of the photography and stunning imagery, you know, sh for the first time shot at, at very high rates of speed so that the water is slowed down and, you know, water droplets are cascading through the air in slow motion. No one had seen that before. 200 frame per second cameras were non-existent up until a couple of years earlier. And the, you know, Jim and I took a gamble to buy these cameras and we waterproofed one of them uh, and I would swim out with it. And then Bud Brown actually figured out even a better water camera with it, the same camera, but a better casing so that he could actually dive below 20 foot waves and survive. Um, and then I, I had this Mitchell high-speed camera that would run all the way to 600 frames a second. I would shoot with telephoto lenses from the shore and get these wonderful images. And um, so the film, when it came out, was visually different and orally different. You know, it was so strikingly new and celebratory of surfing. It truly was a fun experience and a moving experience for everyone. Um, and it, it, we just kept running the film year after year and I'd add new sequences. And, um, but it, it, you know, it was the most expensive surfing film of all up to that point. It was, I think it was $70, $72,000, something like that. 
Wow. And about half of that expense was on the, the music reproduction. Yeah. Just, you know, getting the soundtrack just absolutely stunning. And, and the reproduction of that soundtrack in the theater with gigantic speakers and a magnetic tape running in sync with the film, uh, a separate system completely. The film, film didn't carry the soundtrack like all other movies. Um, the soundtrack was carried separately with a, another machine. And a lot of hassle, you know, a lot of expense, but it sounded unbelievably good. And you couldn't get that kind of sound in any other theater except those that, that we would encase, in, unless it was a 70 millimeter film, you know, like Dr. Dr. Zhivago or Lawrence of Arabia, something like that, that was a showcase in, in one or two theaters in a region. And the, so you ended up being distinctive on a lot of different levels. And I think that's, you know, we never thought we'd break even on the film and, and it turned out that that was not the case. We, you know, it just kept running and running and running and running. People wanted to see it year after year after year. And so we ran it from 72 to 79. So it had like, I haven't counted up the number of, of runs that it had, but it had to be like 10, 10 full runs through California and Hawaii and, and certainly several runs on the East Coast and, uh, and then elsewhere around the world. And the, so you ended up um, surprising us, surprising Bud Brown, surprising everyone that worked on it um, with its success, but we were just very proud of it and proud of its artistry and, and its impact. As you should be. Um, and the themes, it's funny, as you mentioned the themes, they're still, still salient today. You could make a surf film about that today and it would be equally as relevant. Um, who were the cast of characters and how did you choose them in terms of surfers? Well, Jerry Lopez is the number one character and he, um, was featured in one other film up until Five Summer Stories. It was called Sea Dreams. And when I saw him riding small waves at Ala Moana, I went, oh my gosh, this guy is talented. And he's so graceful. Kind of like a David Nuiva, um, but with less nose riding. And because Jerry was so smart, um, you know, he wrote a, a weekly column in the Honolulu Advertiser mag, uh, newspaper, um, which were brilliantly written. And, you know, he's kind of one of those Renaissance characters. And, and so we became friends. And so at, at Pipeline that year, or the, the two years actually, that we filmed on the North Shore, Jerry was like my go-to guy when it would get good, I would call him. When it would get good, he would call me. Um, you know, Bud would get out in the water with his water camera and get great shots. Uh, I would shoot from shore. And um, Jerry, because he is such an energetic surfer, he doesn't look like it when he's, when he's on a wave, but he's paddling continually. He's you know, kind of like Kelly Slater in a way that he's just such knowledge of wave and uh, where waves are coming from and which wave is going to be the best wave. Um, he always got the best rides because he got the best waves mm -hmm. and he would jockey position and, and uh, uh, just was really a wonderful guy to, to shoot. Um, David Nuiva, Jeff Hackman, uh, Nat Young, uh, you know, probably the other main characters. Um, we have a great sequence on Barry Kanaia um, and, and another one with Reno Abalira, um, both who surfing I really love. And, um, but you end up with, 
with the, the hot guys at that time on the North Shore and, and then in California, um, who, you know, were doing unique things, um, all pre-leash, um, and, and filmed in a way that people hadn't seen before. You know, we had a one interesting sequence. It's not in the film net right now, but it was a comparison between Brad McCall and his goofy foot surfing with David Nueva's goofy foot surfing. And that was kind of fun in, in the original version. Um, and then we had, you know, the sequences of competition, which I alluded to and, and which is probably my favorite sequence, except for a sequence called Closed Out, which was, um, basically how the first version was about how surfing spots were disappearing for various reasons, you know, privatization of regions, um, you know, highways being expanded out into the water, uh, harbors being built, those kinds of things. But then uh, on, on this last release, we compare that um, with the things that actually were saved, <laughs> you know, because there's a, a lot of places that have been saved, you know, they, they yeah. wanted to build a harbor at Malaya, um, and it would have destroyed that wave there, which just last week was 15 feet, a perfect Crazy. way. Oh my God. I've never seen Malaya that way. And, but so they built the harbor, but they built it in a way like they should have at Dana. Um, so it didn't impact the surf. Um, but a lot of places have been saved and, and like, you know, trestle being open. So it's not all negative. It's, it's, uh, you know, with surf rider and, and other forces, um, a protest, uh, including the film to some minor degree, you know, things have gotten better and, and competition has gotten to be more fair and, and the surfers are being cut in to the prize money. <laughs> more often um yeah you know and so they're and they're understanding how to do it and how to make a living off of it it's funny that uh you discussed the themes of the film when it was just a concept and the fact that jerry lopez ends up becoming the main star of the film because he's come to really personify those exact that exact ethos uh the harmony of nature and man um, I'm curious how much of that did he embody at that time? Um, pretty much all of that, um, at that time, you know, I think because he's a thinker, um, he understood that importance. Um, you know, he lived on the South shore of Oahu um, with his parents while, when we were filming back in, in 70 and 71. Um, and, you know, he's just a kid and the, you end up, um, but still, you know, he was doing well in school and writing great articles and, and, and thinking about surfing and, and the importance of of the ocean to all of us. And, um, and so he's all, I think always understood that. Okay. You know, I think, I don't think times have changed him much, you know, certainly probably does more meditation now and, yeah, you know, is, is maybe more centered, but he was pretty much that way then, you know, at least at the beginning, the beginning elements of that. Um, and I saw the movie about him. I don't know if you've seen that. I have. Yeah. The Stacy Peralta documentary. Yeah, yeah. And I just love the, the take that they took on it, which was, um, you know, and it, it, the way that it starts out where he apologizes to everyone that he snaked on waves because he was aggressive and, yeah, you know, but, but it kind of was such a juxtaposition and a, uh, a strange thing because he's such a peaceful sedative kind of um 
guy that um you know is 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 so soft and and uh unaggressive on shore and very yeah. quiet spoken and that's i mean that's what's so compelling about i mean that's what surfing is you cannot be uh you can't get a wave at pipeline unless you are hyper aggressive but you also can't surf that wave to its fullest potential unless you're zen like jerry <laughs> so it's a real contrast of things you know and he again he personifies it perfectly he's the guy yeah yeah, yeah. no it's true um but i was just so happy that he was a new character on the scene yeah you know for, for with five summer stories you know i i thought well if we could we we, we should feature someone new and and he just rose to that challenge and um it seemed like every day that pipeline was good he was there early yeah and one of the days i remember it so clearly you know i because bud and i were living just down the street from pipeline and it was one of those days that you don't see it pipeline where it was glassy in the morning and the the early morning light comes over the mountain and shines right into that wave so it's front lit it's not back lit or side lit like it is in the afternoon and evening and i got some of the most amazing slow motion shots of him properly lit um on these beautiful glassy waves and it, it, it's just some of the most gorgeous stuff that i've ever shot and um but you know, here he was there at, at seven o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very few guys do that. You know, they. Yeah. <laughs> and Bud and I were there, but a lot of times we had to wait for a couple hours before people would show up. Yeah, totally. Um, can you tell me about how you met Rick Griffin and how you yeah. got him to make the poster? Well, I'd always admired his work you know not so much the the uh, murphy stuff because i'm i'm not all that into cartooning but the um the graphic art that he had done you know posters for um, various rock bands and so forth and kind of the intricate stuff um the almost mandala kind of work that was so intricate and and so filled with color and and beautiful craftsmanship and um severson had used him for the poster on on pacific vibrations and so i started thinking about him for five summer stories and you know and so i talked to him i got his number and called him up and he was living in San Clemente and he said oh you know I'd love to do that and and he came up with the first poster idea which was a cartoon and I thought about it you know it was quite good actually but um I said you know Rick it, it, this doesn't really work and it um uh, the film is a much more serious um much more artful look at surfing it it's not uh kind of a frivolous kind of film at all it's a it, it's to be taken seriously and i don't want to mislead people um and just right then at the same time kubrick had um come out with a clockwork orange and that had used the a and a clockwork orange the a the shape of the a was uh the largest part of the poster and inside that a was kind of a distorted view of of the main character uh, malcolm mcdowell and in his strangeness and um i said i showed rick that and i said what can you do that's along this line you know where you 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 make a piece of art which is 
interesting and thought provoking uh, and, and uh, but gives you a key to what the film is all about. And so, you know, I, and I showed him parts of the film and, um, and he said, oh yeah, okay, I'll think about it. So he went home and, and thought about it for a couple of weeks and he came back with a sketch and I said, oh my God, that's great. And so it was the guy holding the bar of wax and the bar of wax was, you know, and we, when we talked it out was the key to unlock the, you know, the, the joy of surfing. Um, it was what was going to, <laughs> and, and, and uh, sex wax had just can't come out this gooey wax. I mean, before that, everyone was using paraffin, which was really bad sex wax. I think Mike Doyle and Garth Murphy and a few people came up with it, Encinitas. And uh, um, it was, it was like revolutionary. You could actually yeah. stick to your board. And the, uh, um, and Griffin, you know, said, you know, this, he felt, okay, this would be really a great idea. And I thought so too. And, and we kind of used David Nuiva as sort of an example of that, you know, with the stringy hair, but, but I didn't want to just have David be there. I wanted more, more of a generalized surfer, someone you wouldn't recognize. And, and so Rick came up with that character and, and, and put the girl in the background so that it would give girls a sense that they were included in this too. And, um, and so, but, but by the time that he had done all this, um, you know, we had to get the posters out really fast. And, and I think the first run of the film, the posters came out and were in the stores and on the telephone poles like two weeks before the premiere, um, which was not good. You know, it, it should yeah. have been two, two months before the premiere. And, but still I went, oh, Rick, you did, did a fantastic job. And so it, it, I think I paid him something like, you know, $3,000 to do it. And he said, now, Greg, you know, you, you can buy the art too. And, and I said, I don't have money to buy the art. Your art is unbelievable. You know, it sells for big money. And he said, well, I'll sell it to you for 4,000, you know, an extra 4,000. So, and I said, I don't have 4,000. And I wish I'd done it, of course, now, but the, uh, um, you know, it, it, it was, it was funny, but, but Griffin was a great guy and, um, you know, a, a little unreliable, you know, in, in, in delivering on time. And I think Severson had more problems than I did because he had worked with them so many, so many times in the past, but I just loved, loved his art. I just loved yeah. the way he thought about things. Um, and, you know, some of the things that he did were so much better than anything that anyone was doing at the time, you know, with, especially with his craftsmanship, just beautiful craftsmanship. If you see some of his big paintings that are, you know, they, they used to have a surf art store in Laguna and I'd go in there and there are a few Griffin things that were for sale, you know, for $40,000 or something. And I just go, look at this. It's like, some of the best art craftsmanship that you could ever see. Yeah. He was, he was well, brilliant. I had never heard that um, reference to a clockwork orange, but it actually makes sense. And yeah. um, the geometry of the five summer stories poster too, is like that wax is a portal. Yeah. You know, and you said it is the key to unlock, but it's almost this portal that you have to go through and behind it, is all of the other beauty in that poster and the the woman and the promise of the surf and all that sort of stuff. So it's really well conceived and beautifully executed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I think Rick told me at one point, he said, you know, the 
I love making the wax purple because it reminds me of purple acid. <laughs> Funny. Oh my I gosh. went, I went, well, I haven't taken purple acid yet. But the, <laughs> That's hilarious. I, he goes, because your film is like that, you know? Yeah. Went, okay. Well, what did the success of Five Summer Stories do for your career? Well, you know, right then, before, uh, you know, in 1970, Jim and I decided not to make any more surfing films. So after the Sunshine Sea, um, we had all kinds of opportunities in Hollywood. And so we were taking them. And, you know, they were challenging filmmaking assignments. They were things that were new to us. They were things that were more difficult to do. And we liked all of that. And uh, we we wanted to expand our horizons, even if it, you know, wasn't as profitable or, you know, didn't, it, it, maybe we failed at it. We, we just wanted to move into something new. We'd, we'd done two or three surfing films or four surfing films before that. And, and we were ready for a change, you know, it, and it, part of it is, is, in the filmmaking business, you don't want to repeat yourself. Um, you know, people who get sucked into doing a television show week after week feel that, um, you know, so much of it is a wasted effort because you're repeating, you know, you're, you're doing the same thing year, uh, time after time and year after year. And you want to challenge yourself in new ways. And so we were ready to go out and, but then I had an idea uh, that, that I've told you about, you know, the, the thematic idea and the idea to, to make the film as pieces rather than a continuous story. And, and I thought, I, I sold Jim on the idea that we could actually do this and do our Hollywood thing too. And, um, and that Bud, if Bud Brown worked with us, um, you know, he could do a lot of the heavy lifting in Hawaii um, and I could go over and do the storytelling elements and, uh, and, and some of the more documentary things. Um, and so that's the way we did, we decided, okay, let's, let's try it and let's do it with, you know, make it the musical thing. And we came up with all those ideas that I went through, but, um, so our career path was expanding in, into Hollywood at that moment anyway five summer stories energized that and it did help us a huge amount um you know and the fact that it played year after year after year you know for seven years um um continued that year after you know i mean it was it's astounding that the, the reputation that we had in Southern California and Hawaii, particularly, because those were the hotbeds of the audience back then. Um, and they were huge crowds and um, the enthusiasm was so intense, so, so fun to see. Um, it was just a joyous time. Yeah. And, and so, and, and, and society was undergoing all this turmoil and you know trying to get out of the vietnam war and and you know surfing was going through turmoil and it was somewhat fragmented and um, so in a way the thematic elements of different stories joined together those fragments were kind of mirrored what was happening in surfing anyway um and, and I think gave the audience enough variety um, so that, you know, they, they didn't get bored with it being a surfing film. And, and the, those other elements are really part and parcel of what drove the non-surfer to come to see that film. Totally. Um, you know, the, after running it for two years, we would do polls. Um, we'd arrive at the theater at, at you know, 5.30 and the show is at six and 
there'd be a line around the block and, and I'd go down uh, or Barbara would do, do this too and Cindy would do it at various theaters. And we'd ask people if they'd ever touched a surfboard and half uh, by the third run, half of the people said that they had never touched a surfboard. Wow. And we then realized that, okay, this is, this is more of a rock concert. It's more of a youthful expression of, of an idea, an idea of freedom and, and art and um, kind of letting yourself into a new realm. And, and so much of that was to the credit of the music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the honk track and, and all the Beach Boy songs um, just took people to another place. And uh, um, it, I still very vividly remember, you know, every year when we'd re-release -re the film, I would for sure go in at a, you know, six o'clock screening, sit on the theater and just let it bathe me with joy. It just washed over you in a way yeah. that, that uh, no other surfing film in, in my memory had done. And 90% uh, and of that is because of the music. Yeah. Um, you keep referencing Jim Freeman. Who is Jim Freeman to you? And because um, it's uncommon for a filmmaker to partner with another filmmaker for kind of, a, you know, maybe for one film, but not for a career. So who is Jim? And why did you elect to do that? <laughs> um, well, I, after I'd made my second surfing film and I was at Santa Barbara at, at college at UCSB and um, a guy came into town to show a 3D surfing film and it was Jim Freeman. And the film wasn't very good. It had one really great sequence of about 10 minute sequence which just showed brilliance of filmmaking skill. Um, and so I went up to Jim after the screening, he was down front narrating. And, and I said, well, geez, I, I'm making films too and blah, blah, blah. And you know, I've heard about your films. I, uh, and so he, I, I said, well, you know, you know so much about technique, you know, I think I could learn a lot from you. You know, we should, we should talk, you know, and I, he, he was at pre-med at, at Loma Linda University. And so I said, well, let's share telephone numbers. And, and if you ever have an idea or a question, give me a call and vice versa. And, and so we would talk about once a month um, while we were in school. And, and he, you know, he had plenty of really great uh, information about how to do laboratory work and do sound work and um, you know keys of, of uh, things that I didn't know and uh, and then we came up with an idea to make a film together and so we we went to South America we pulled our funds and went to South America to make a surfing film down there and that became free and easy and and it was such a good film. It was like one and one equaling three. Um, he taught me what he knew. I taught him what I knew. We pushed each other every day in a constructive way. We were great friends. After, after two months working together, we were probably best friends. And, um, and then our girlfriends became best friends. And for 12 years, we worked together um, every day making movies. And whether they be, you know, a, a surfing film or a film about dune buggies or a film about, you know, skiing or a film of, uh, about birds or whatever, um, hang gliding, you name it. We, we pushed each other and made each other better. And then when he was killed, um, 
you know, scouting, we were going to do some Kodak commercials. Um, this is in 76, right after we'd finished To Fly, our first IMAX film. Um, he went up to scout in a helicopter at locations in the Sierras. And, uh, and I was back east getting ready to premiere To Fly at the Smithsonian. And uh, the helicopter crashed and, and he was killed. And um, not only did that change my life um, and, you know, but I think about him all the time. You know, it's, it's now been, you know, almost 50 years since then. And the, uh, you know, you, you end up with some amazing connections in your life. But for me and, and for Barbara, my wife, that was the most moving and um, important connection that we ever had. And uh, I mean, Freeman was just such a wonderful person and, you know, smart and funny and aggressive. And he had nerves of steel. He would you know, when I would always shy away at going, asking someone for a favor, he would just go right up and do it. <laughs> and, and so the combination between the two of us was really good. And, uh, and the joy of making films together was really good. And even though we were like, like you say, it's rare to have two people sharing creative responsibilities partly because they have to share the profits and it's usually you're not making any money on films. And so when you cut it in half, <laughs> half of very little is not very much. And so, um, but, you know, thankfully are we, we shared this belief that if you really do something great and put all your heart and soul and money into it, that eventually the money will come, back and reward you and that proved itself out you know, five summer stories was another example but all of our IMAX films were that same way and um and so I we we still believe that here at our company we just keep keep working on a film until we think we have it perfect yeah the it is rare to share creative duties like that but it's equally as rare to have the humility that you have, you clearly have confidence and a, um, you know, you know what your strengths are and you know what your vision is, but to kind of recognize the strength of the soundtrack and the role, the soundtrack and the role that that plays in the film or to recognize Jim's strengths and that he can elevate yours is rare. So I love hearing the humility. Well, thanks. I, I think that, um, probably because each of us had our own confidence okay. built, built from our parents. Um, and, you know, I mean, no one had ever done a 3D surfing film <laughs> right. before Jim or since. And <laughs> it's just, you know, it, it was a hairball idea. And the, the, and part of the reason is that it doesn't lend, surfing doesn't lend itself to 3D because the action takes place so far from where the camera can be. Um, and you you could try to shoot everything for, with a water camera, but it'd be next to impossible to keep the water drops um, off one lens to the other. Um, and, and so it was basically an impossible thing that, but he wanted to try. And so we went out and tried it. And that's what I enjoyed with that first film um, that he made. And um, it, but it, but it showed, you know, his ability to say, well, what if, let's just try it, you know, let's, let's get out there and do it. Um, and that's what we did with so many things, you know, hang gliding, you know, we were the first to film hang gliding um, we had no clue whether or not we'd ever make our, our hang gliding investment pay off, but it paid off in, 
and triples and the um, it led to our role in doing two fly for in IMAX and, and potentially to our whole career in, in the IMAX world, which has really led my life since, uh, you know, since 1980 or so. Um, and so it, it, um, it wasn't hard to share responsibilities with Jim. Um, you know, our egos didn't get in the way. And uh, though I'm sure we, we both had strong egos and drives and we essentially were working 12 hour a day minimum and um, but that didn't bother us because filmmaking was a hobby you know and it still yeah. is you know I <laughs> you know people ask me okay why aren't you retired and I and I say well it's my hobby you know yeah or, I I carry a camera when I go to a wedding and I, I shoot videos for people um, yeah. you know, whether they want it or not, they're going to get it. <laughs> well, your list of credits is vast, but I'm going to ask you just a couple specific questions about your time working in, uh, narrative features outside of documentary. Um, yeah. tell me about getting that call from Stanley Kubrick and, uh, what film did you work on with him and how did that change your life? Um, he called me because on a film called Skyriders, which was with hang gliders that we shot for 20th Century Fox in Greece, um, a narrative film with uh, James Coburn as the star, um, who became a friend. And so anyway, on that film, my assistant director, was hired from England and his name was Brian Cook. And he just had finished working for seven years on Barry Lyndon. <laughs> and, and he's, he's you know, after working with Brian for two months in Greece, hot Greek summer, you know, we had a great, great time, but it was shot wonderful footage. And, you know, Brian said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put you together with, with Stanley, you know, the two of you are just crazy as one, you know, and, and, and this is when Jim was still alive and, and Jim and I went, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. And so a year passes by or two or something like that. And, and Kubrick calls and my secretary downstairs says, there's some guy, and I think it's one of your buddies, claiming to be Stanley Kubrick. And this is back when we had intercoms. And I went, oh yeah, right. You think I should take it? She goes, well, I don't know. You decide. So I picked up the phone and fully expecting it to be one of my surfer buddies, knowing that I loved Kubrick's films and studied them deeply. Um, and, you know, sure enough, was it was Kubrick and and he would just do all his own work. You know, he he did everything he, he was. If I learned and I learned tons from him, but one of the big things I learned was that don't delegate, do it yourself. You'll get it done right the first time and it'll be much more streamlined and it'll turn out better. And secondly, since you love what you do anyway, just, yeah, he, he would work 16 hour days. And certainly I'd work 16 hour days on some projects, but he did it every day, seven days a week. You know, the guy was full of energy. And anyway, so we hit it off on the phone. And, and then he said, I really want you to come over here and I said, well, I might be able to come next week. And he said, come as soon as you can. And so I went over there and it was great because they'd already shot for four or five months and uh, in a, a 13 month shoot. Now, most films, most big feature films are like two month shoots. Um, 
Kubrick would hire everyone on a long-term basis. You'd work for less money per day because you knew it was gonna be a great show, a good credit for yourself. And because in the long haul, you're gonna make more money and then sitting around waiting for another job to come through. And so um, he got everyone for a cut rate, you know, 50% of your normal rate, um, including Nicholson and everyone else. And uh, in fact, Nicholson was so funny, you know, you just wonderful guy to be around because um, there's a lot of waiting on film sets, particularly a Kubrick set where everything's got to be perfect. And the, uh, he said, Greg, I, I, I'm hoping that this goes over the 11 months that he has me scheduled for. And I said, well, why? Aren't you tired of this? He said, no, you know, if it goes over, you know, I get something like, you know, 20,000 a day, and that's just going to kill Kubrick. Because <laughs> he's going to hate paying me that much. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's like 200,000 a day today. And so you, you end up going, okay. I mean, Kubrick was cheaper than anyone, but, but he basically, you know, everyone loved him. And although he was hard on people, he was really hard on people. He, he never yelled at me, but he yelled at everyone else. He, he might not have ever yelled at, at Nicholson, but he yelled at, at uh, Shelley Duvall, and he yelled at his director of photography, and he yelled at Brian, and, you know, the, the poor crew was yelled at a lot. Um, but um, he was wonderful to work with, though. And, uh, you know, it... Uh, it, it, but it taught me so much about how to make films on a budget and how to get the most out of a budget, but also how to be innovative and how to keep trying. If you don't get the scene right the first time, don't be embarrassed to go back and reshoot it. And he'd do that time and time again. And, you know, I, we did all the, the, the second unit work, which is all the stuff that uh, took place in a, in America, and he had me shoot three times more than what he ne needed. You know, mm -hmm. three times more sequences. So we did multiple sequences that never were seen by anyone. Um, they were pretty good too. Um, wow. But he just, you know, he wants to go into the editing bay with with a film that's three, four, five hours long. And then keep cutting it down, right. getting to the bare essence of what it is. Get get it down to an hour and forty five minutes, and uh, and that's what he did with every one of his films. And sometimes he should have kept cutting. So you know, like Barry Lyndon could have been cut some, um, and maybe the pace could have been upped in a few sequences. But what a every one of his films was a is a treasure though. I agree. Um, it goes without saying, but the film was The Shining. I did yeah. not say oh, that yeah. in the yeah. in the introduction. Um, have you or have you seen the documentary Room Two Three Seven? Yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on those theories that are in the film? All of them are preposterous. You know that, yeah. and I enjoy that that they they spend the time to. I mean, Kubrick is a deep character. He's so well read about everything and so fun to go to lunch with uh, or dinner with and you know to be around and you know and I I spent every day with him just following him around and I was over there twice and and he loved it you know because I'd ask pertinent questions and and uh, um, because I was you know, maybe 20 years younger, maybe 25 years younger than he, and he, he had uh, either two or three daughters and his, uh, Vivian is his uh, 16 or 17 year old daughter was there shooting a documentary. And so we palled around and, and, but I think he almost looked at me as kind of a somewhat son, you know, in a bizarre way. And the, the, uh, 
and so and we enjoyed each other um partly because i was quiet and you know he was so talkative and you know he liked my questions <laughs> and it you know he knew i cared about film that was the key i mean if yeah if you if you didn't understand filmmaking and lenses and cameras and film stocks and because i'd shot an imax film already he was so intrigued by that and i'd gotten to know spielberg a little bit and he was very intrigued by that and the uh um, but he you know he was isolated he mm. this is before cable tv before cnn you know you he didn't hear about what was happening in hollywood or right. you know it it wasn't the same world well, I love that you said that those uh, theories in room 237 are preposterous because I agree, they seemed preposterous to me, but because Kubrick is such a detailed filmmaker, it leaves people with the opportunity to actually oh, draw yeah. all of these conclusions, you know, like a lesser filmmaker, it is just what it is and there's no other explanation but with great art you can draw your own conclusions and yeah. there's these people overthinking it because there's that much detail so that's what i love about it yeah 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 you know it's just like you know people for a long time thought certainly the man landing on the moon was was staged by stanley kubrick and those kinds of really back back then he was a very quiet character um he wouldn't do interviews or very rarely do an interview and never a televised interview um you know and so when i went over there i had no clue what i was who what he looked like um mm -hmm. you know and it 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 it, it got better after the shining after vivian did her video and he started to become a little looser with his image and who he was and, and where he was going um but he always was very private yeah. um you know he didn't think that people needed to know him for him to have a position he thought it would right. be more mysterious if they didn't know him. And so that played right into the conspiracy people. Completely. Um, but you know, his, his, uh, um, his right hand and left hand, and, and it, besides being Brian Cook, it was also his brother-in-law, Jan Harlan, and this actor um, who was assigned to kind of shepherd me around and so I could watch the footage any anytime I wanted to and and uh, um his name escapes me right now it's it's in the book um but he was given an interview regarding the room 237 or whatever it was and he he said he he knows Kubrick deeper than anyone except for maybe Christine and and uh, he said, all of that's just hogwash. Yeah. And so it's still, still fun though. Yeah, oh, it is. It's so fun. <laughs> you know, and even the, there, there is a shot. One of the conspiracy elements was one of our aerial shots. Uh, Kubrick had made a mistake and actually trimmed the shot not soon enough. And a little bit of, you know, like three frames of a, helicopter shadow comes into the shot yeah depending on what format you're looking at it in and they they were claiming that that was some intentional thing <laughs> it, it, I, I wish it were but it wasn't <laughs> yeah so are a, you were you responsible for that helicopter sh uh, shot over the car oh approaching? yeah oh yeah all of that you know we did everything that uh that he couldn't do you know he built the sets in london and didn't leave london and so we shot everything in america and so the 
the airplane landing and uh, you know the thia calls going up the mountain and the, the whole beginning sequence with all the aerials at Glacier National Park and then the later sequence of Jack and Wendy going up the mountain to to live in the at the overlook and um, various other scenes through the film um, lots of things that we shot you know with Halloran um, you know Scatman Crothers um, in Miami and uh, stuff in Denver and um, the um, some some which was used and some not not used and the uh, the greatest thing was when we were working together for that year he would call me about once every two weeks go great i've got a new idea i need you to do this <laughs> and, then, and i had other things going on but I go, okay, I'll drop everything, to try to do this work. <laughs> and he just was full of joy of filmmaking. And it, uh, uh, it, it was really fun working with him. What an experience. It, it was great. It was really, it was life-changing for me. Yeah. Um, do you mind if we take a quick restroom break before we finish? Oh, no, fine. Yeah. Okay, go, go cool. Right yeah, that'll... That'll allow me to relax through the last portion. <laughs> I'm going to leave it recording though. Okay. Okay. Right. How are you doing on time? Um, I probably should cut it pretty, you know, soon. <laughs> okay. Um, should we try to end at four? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Let's do that. Um, can you tell me the story about nearly dying while you were filming Big Wednesday? That was um, one of the more interesting wipeout experiences of my life, for sure, because it was different. Um, you know, I shot from the water and surfed semi big waves, but shot in big waves, um, even at Waimea and Sunset. Um, and pipeline and I'd been in probably a hundred wipeouts you know where you get churned and held down and um, I'm a good swimmer and so I'm relaxed in the water and you know I always always keep my eyes open um, when I'm underwater and and so I never felt fearful at all with a wipeout um except for this one and the thing that was different is that it was like a two-wave hold down at sunset on a big closeout wave that broke way into the channel and um you know boards were flying and i dove deep and um went down and it was a two-wave thing and the, the second wave was close behind it and by the time i got up essentially i didn't get to the surface to get a, a breath and the other wave hit and turned me more and by the time that i got back you know and knowing where to go i couldn't get through the froth to get to the get to air and never had that happened before at sunset or anywhere and this was at sunset beach and the and it turned out that um when i talked to eddie i cow about it afterward he said oh my god yeah that has that has happened to him um a couple of times and what happens is the, the maybe on a second or third wave of a set the, the water becomes so aerated, it becomes like foam. And to get through it, to swim up through it, especially when you don't have fins on, um, is next to impossible. You, you're, you're in quicksand. And, you know, panic sets in and your, your legs are kicking like mad and you're 
arms are flailing and stroking as fast as you can. Um, thankfully, you know, I got my nose just above the froth and got an, a bit of air before I passed out. Um, but I could, you know, I could tell that that I was near the end. And so then the next wave hit, but I had air in me and washed me in and into the calm area at sunset. And, and lo and behold, my board was about 20 feet away and the camera that I, the big Panavision camera in a waterproof housing <laughs> was another 20 feet away. Well, that was lucky. But I went over and crawled on the board and laid there for, God, probably three or four minutes before I even went over and got the camera. Um, and then I rode a small wave in and up on the shore and just laid there for 20 minutes, more, 20 more minutes. And, and, you know, it was one of those deals where it was so bizarre because I'd gone through that experience multiple times and felt confident but then all of a sudden something new happened mm. um, and it uh, and then it, you know Eddie told me about his experiences and then Bud Brown who was also shooting for us over there like two or three days later had the same exact experience and I don't know if it was that season or you know what you know, because I'd never even heard of that happening there at, at, at the North Shore. You know, Mavericks is a different kind of hold down. It's yeah. not only a push down, but it's a suck down. <laughs> There's a channel there that, you know, has caught multiple surfers in and um, where you're you're pushed down by the wave, but then you're sucked down and you're not ready for that. Uh, so even if the surfers and who now have vests on, still you're getting sucked down because um, there's the channel creates its own suction. So you're like in a toilet bowl that's pulling you down. Um, and if you're used to big waves in Hawaii where that doesn't happen, um, it's it's a new thing and i think that's why they've lost you know more people there in mavericks than probably need be yeah the camera rig adds a lot of complexity to the equation as well well that you know i i just pushed the camera away and and dove deep the, the water camera was uh, buoyant and so it just got tumbled and thankfully it was okay didn't run in any surfers or any boards or anything um sadly much of the world is going to watch the remastered five summer stories <laughs> yeah. on their laptop or even worse their phone so what are they losing in that experience well the what we've done is we've taken the 16 millimeter original um which has been, you know, in the vault, you know, for 50 years. And we digitized it at the highest rate that we could get and then processed that. And so it looks brilliant. It looks like a brand new film, um, but sharper and better than ever before. And with digital, you know, you can resharpen things and change color and do all kinds of great manipulation. Um, and so it does truly look better than ever. And uh, we did the same thing with the sound. And then I, I edited what I think is the best of all the versions. You know, there were four main versions to the film released over those seven years. And so I've taken the best from each one of those versions and um, you know, in, in, included those things. So it's a different version than, than any of the versions that people have seen before. Um, you know, the, the, the main elements are there, you know, so 80% yeah. of the film is, is intact and 20% is 
possibly things that people haven't seen before. Well, the new version is going to look better than a previous version, of course, the re because it's remastered. But I want you to give the people the sales pitch for why they should watch it on the big screen rather <laughs> than at home on their phone. Yeah. As a, well, as a guy as a guy who's worked in IMAX and is a proponent of the format, why should they watch it on the big screen? Simply, I think they'll lose about 40% of its impact and power. It is an audiovisual experience. And you have to see it big to enjoy that experience. Seeing it small, you're still getting the story content, but you're not getting the power and the beauty of it. And those two elements are so, so good in this film, so meaningful that it's worth the trouble to, to see it bigger and, and to see it in a place where the sound system is really good. Um, that's my argument. And, you know, I think that it, it takes it from probably a B experience to an A plus experience. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, just but... like, you wouldn't want to see 2001, a space odyssey you know, on a, on a TV screen or a, a telephone. Yeah. Those are worth, uh, making the effort alone, but they're amplified by having other people in the room as well. And so the surf film experience is best with a group of people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, like I, I said, when you're in a room, like, like I was when we premiered the film at the Santa Monica Civic and people are going bananas around you, that contagious spirit of youthful energy is just, it's so um, validating of just being alive, you know, being, you know, enjoying something that is so unique in this world. You know, I mean, surfing yeah. is the most different sport ever. Yeah. Uh, it's hard even to call it a sport. You know, it's an activity, it's a life. Um, and you wanna, you wanna feel it, just like Completely. you feel it, the water. Well, it's funny if I'm in a theater watching a, you know, scripted feature, I want everybody to shut up and not make a noise. If I'm watching <laughs> a surf film, the more yeah. raucous, the better. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Um, final question is just, what is your current relationship like with surfing? Are you still surfing? I was up until two years ago. I live at a surfing spot. I live at Thalia Street in Laguna and have been at the same house for 50 years and the reason that that we chose to live there was because of surfing and um i knew that well thalia steep particularly is tide dependent and swell direction dependent uh and so it's only good for like a half an hour every day <laughs> but there's almost every day has a half an hour when it's really good and that's what I've done for the last, you know, 50 years since I've lived there is, is gotten out there as often as I can. And that's usually at least once a week. Um, now, because my pop-up, I've got pretty strong arthritis from doing too many activities. My pop-up is now a crawl up and <laughs> it's not fast enough for the Thalia Street wave. It might be good you know, for a Waikiki wave, yeah. but it's, it's not good enough for, for Thalia. And so um, I do more swimming now than I do surfing, which is a, a pity, but I still, I adore the water. And so I'm out there when, um, at least once a week. You miss surfing? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, and it, it's, it's sad when that happens. You don't think it could happen ever when you're my age. And then all of a sudden it happens. And the pain of the jump up 
overrides your your brain in a way that is uh, I've never experienced before. Yeah. You just you, your your brain won't allow you to push through that. Um, well, swim into a couple of body surfing. <laughs> I know I could do that. <laughs> That's a perfect spot to do it too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you, appreciate you taking this amount of time and um, really really love the book. Well, thanks. I love that. I, you know, I, I hope others do. You know, I, I have no clue, you know, whether uh, people enjoy it or, or be critical of it. But the, um, you know, obviously you hope that, that they'll get something out of it. I can't imagine what the criticism would be, um, but it's really a relic of surf history i mean there's so many great stories in there with icons that i think it's really valuable yeah i've been lucky to to be kind of at the right place at the right time and um you know i'm so thankful for that yeah well we're grateful for you sharing <laughs> it, so thank you yeah well great to see you okay thanks, thanks for so much it. greg no okay. problem <laughs> bye bye